This episode of Killer Cures tells the story of how a simple fascination with sea snails led to a $700 million discovery. And like the story of any great scientific discovery, is also the story of the inspired thinkers who made it happen. Meet Professor Baldomero Oliveira, affectionately referred to by friends and colleagues by his nickname, Toto. While he's now a distinguished professor of molecular neuroscience at the University of Utah in the USA, he grew up in the Philippines as an amateur shell collector. During his childhood, he'd heard about a type of snail that would sometimes kill fishermen with its venom, the geographer cone snail. He was studying and working in the USA during the early period of biotech development. Well, it turns out I just was incredibly lucky. I did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Stanford Biochemistry Department. I got a project that led me to purify a very important enzyme of uh, DNA metabolism called DNA ligase, which later turned out to be absolutely essential for cloning and genetic engineering. He returned to Manila to take up a new role at the University of the Philippines. As the new lab was still being prepared, Toto had some time on his hands. So, I mean, I literally, when I moved to the Philippines had a room that was empty, right? There wasn't much equipment there at all. With the minimal equipment he had available to him, Toto decided to investigate a point of interest from his childhood, geographer cones, and specifically, how their venom was able to kill people. So I thought, okay, let's start this temporary project <laughs> until we get the equipment we need to carry out the DNA project that uh, I thought was going to be our main thing. So our, our initial assays were all geared towards trying to understand why people who got stung by conus geographers uh, would die. Toto's initial research was into the medical records of cone snail related deaths. The medical report suggested that cone snails kill people by paralyzing their lungs, preventing breathing. We initially were, were very uh, focused on purifying what it was that caused paralysis uh, in that venom. Getting the snails was as simple as hitting up a few contacts he had from his days as an amateur shell collector. And pretty soon, the lab was stocked full of killer snails. Once in the lab, Toto and his team would carefully dissect the snails and remove their venom ducts. Then they would extract the pure venom, the part they needed to analyze. Like most venoms, cone snail venoms aren't pure substances. They're complex mixtures of chemical compounds. Peptides are made of chains of chemical building blocks called amino acids, and they perform important biological functions. Peptides that come from cone snails are also sometimes referred to as conopeptides. And if there's any word from this series you need to understand, it's that one. Because that is what we're going to be calling them for the rest of this series. There are actually a few hundred conopeptides in geographer cone venom. They needed to find out exactly which of the conopeptides in the snail's venom caused the paralysis. The next step was to separate the venoms out into their constituent parts. They did this using high performance liquid chromatography. They decided to try and test all of the different conopeptides they extracted from the geographer snail's venom. They did this by injecting them into mice and seeing if the mice would become paralyzed. And so the assays were really uh, to detect things that could uh, paralyze muscle. They performed these tests in Toto's new lab in the University of the Philippines and were able to identify two conopeptides that caused the mice to fall off the mesh, showing 
that they had been paralyzed. These two must have been the components that caused people to die when stung. But more interestingly, both of the conopeptides that caused paralysis did so with a different trick. One of them works in the same way as the venom from a cobra, while the other works in the same way as the fugu toxin in pufferfish that famously kill the people who eat them, unless they've been prepared by an expert chef to make them safe to eat. So, what this research shows is that getting stung by a geographer cone is like getting bitten by a cobra and swallowing a lethal dose of poisonous pufferfish <laughs> at the same time. A seriously lethal combo. So, that's how cone snails can kill people. But what about the $700 million discovery? Well, as often happens, you try and study one thing, and another comes up unexpectedly. Toto had already done what he set out to do. He'd worked out how geographer snails were able to kill people. So the project was looking more or less finished. Toto was still employed in the US for part of the year, meaning he had access to both cone snails from the Philippines and to state-of-the-art biotech facilities in the USA. Remember all those other conopeptides in the venom? Well, most of these didn't seem to do anything when they were injected into the mice, so they were getting ignored. Well, no, the, the real breakthrough, I would say, there was a kid in here in Utah his name was Craig Clark, and he said, you know, I think you're doing the assay all wrong because you're just injecting mice uh, IP. You really should be injecting mice uh, directly into their central nervous system. Um, and I didn't think it was such a good idea, but uh, he did the experiment anyway. <laughs> the results were astonishing. When Craig started injecting them directly into the mouse's central nervous system, he found that the other conopeptides that previously had done nothing caused a whole slew of new reactions. One would send the mouse to sleep, and another would make it hyperactive. Scratching, leaping, and shaking were all observed in conopeptides that were previously thought to have no effect. There are over a thousand species of cone snail and each individual species has hundreds of conopeptides that are unique to that species. So investigating them all was going to be a serious undertaking. The task was shared out between researchers and students in Totter's lab. Among them was Michael McIntosh, a student fresh out of high school who was working with the magician cone snail, a species that preys on live fish. Michael McIntosh may have been straight out of high school at this point in the Killer Cures story, but fast forward to the present, and he's still one of the key characters. Michael holds two different positions at the University of Utah, one as a director of psychiatric research, and the other as a research professor in Toto's lab, where he continues to research cone snail venoms. One of the really enjoyable things was that the students in the lab were each given projects to work on under supervision of course and so I was assigned if you will a particular venom to work on from Conus Magus and then kind of turned loose in a sense had the good fortune really luck to have something in that particular venom that turned out later to be useful as a, a medicine. We really had no idea at the time. And so I found a component in the venom that caused the mice to shake. So cleverly, we called it the shaker activity. While it caused shaking in mice, it seemed otherwise unexceptional. So when the lab team published their findings on the shaker peptide, they had no idea what significance it would prove to have. Following the publication, a biotechnology company picked up the research baton on the shaker peptide. We really didn't know uh, what it might be useful for at the time. But there was a biotech company that started to work on it, 
and this was during the biotech bubble days when uh, you know people were willing to invest money on, on an idea with really very uh, little concrete data. But anyway, this biotech company managed to get this compound uh, into clinical trials. Their work led them to find a potential pharmaceutical use for the peptide. They thought it could be used as a new type of pain relief drug. If you didn't know, pain relief is big business for pharmaceutical companies. There is as yet no perfect pain relief drug. The current go-to chemical for treating acute pain is morphine. And while effective in the short term, it's infamous for coming with a host of terrible drawbacks. This is why they're interested in anything that might inhibit pain signaling. If they could turn it into a product, they could make a huge amount of money from its sales. Following successful clinical trials, the shaker peptide, omega conotoxin M7A, was actually licensed by the US FDA as a drug treatment for intractable pain, meaning it can be used in cases where other pain treatments, like morphine, are no longer useful for reducing a patient's pain. It's now sold under the brand name, Prealt, meaning primary alternative, reflecting its use as the alternative to morphine for relieving pain. Let's take a look at how Prealt actually works because it is seriously interesting. After all, why would a fish hunting cone snail have a substance in its venom that can block pain signals in humans? First, let's see how it's meant to be used for hunting fish. The magician cone injects its venom into the fish and the fish gets paralyzed, losing its ability to swim away. Normally, the fish swims using its muscles. When it decides to swim, electrical impulses get sent out from its brain and travel along the nervous system. When the impulse reaches a muscle, the muscle activates and the fish swims. Prealt works by preventing the transmission of impulses from the fish's nervous system from ever reaching the muscles. This leaves the fish paralyzed. It tries telling its muscles to swim but the nervous system can't deliver the message to the muscles. So why doesn't Prealt paralyze humans? How does it relieve pain instead? Somewhere along the path of evolution, the nervous system of mammals ended up being wired a little differently to that of fish. In mammals, Prealt still blocks the transmission of nerve impulses but it does so in a different part of the circuitry. Instead of stopping nerve signals reaching muscles, as is the case with fish, in mammals, Prealt blocks the parts of the circuitry that relay pain signals from the body to the brain. So while a patient's body might still be sending pain signals, Prealt blocks those signals from ever reaching the person's brain, which means the patient won't feel any of it. It's interesting to know that a molecule can paralyze one animal and yet prevent pain in another, all due to the differences in the wiring layouts of our nervous systems. So really it was a conceptual advance because had you not injected it into the nervous system, you would have just concluded that it was an inactive component. It was also patented by the biotech company giving them exclusive rights to use and sell the drug for 20 years. <laughs> That's a funny story because uh, uh, it was worth a lot to some people, <laughs> right? not to us. We never patented the compound. So, although the shaker peptide found in the magician cone snail's venom, Prealt, came to be valued at 700 million US dollars, Toto and his team did not profit from the discovery, as the financial rewards went to the company that patented the drug. What may have started out as a simple stopgap project investigating a childhood interest for Toto, that was essentially just used to fill in time while the lab was being set up, turned into a discovery that would reshape the rest of his career in a way that couldn't possibly have been predicted. 
and it was a single undergraduate's decision to try something different against his professor's advice that led to a whole new avenue of biomedical research. So, what next for Toto and the Killer Snails? In the next episode, we'll take a look at how the cone snail venoms are now being studied to help combat the opioid crisis. So here we've been for a couple of decades where we just keep prescribing these to people, and lo and behold, it shouldn't be any surprise to any of us that our addiction rates have gone up, that our dependence rates have gone up, that our overdose rates and death rates have gone up, because the more of these substances that are out there, the more people are going to fall prey to them. And one of the things that's particularly exciting about the cone snail peptide that we're currently working on is it doesn't just mask the pain, but seems to also be disease modifying. This is Max Taylor signing off from episode two of Killer Cures. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time for more Killer Cures. Thank <laughs> you.